to both focus on topological data analysis. We're going to start this week with looking at this mapper software here, and I forgot to change the pen, so let's get the pen out. So we're going to focus this first week on the mapper software. Uh, it is a, a fairly easy to introduce software that really doesn't require much in terms of mathematical background, so you don't need to know any homology uh, this first week. So I think it's a good way to just introduce topological data analysis, and that way we can start working with software right away. We will uh, have to discuss a lot of uh, issues with uh, data analysis, and we will do that throughout the course. Uh, but we'll start off with some concrete examples so people have seen some data analysis before we get into things. So that's what we'll focus on this first week. In September, we'll focus on persistent homology, which will require some background in algebraic topology. So if you haven't yet listened to those preparatory lectures, and if you're not familiar with algebraic topology, you might want to listen to some of those. Um, we will also, uh, if there's anything that you want to hear about, let me know. So we can do topics that are of interest to you, as well as I will ask for speaker input from this is a course that will hope to prepare you for the special year at the IMA on scientific and engineering applications of algebraic topology. So I will email the various speakers for these uh, various different uh, workshops. And so we might have some specialized uh, topics uh, related to those workshops in addition to persistent homology. But our main focus, so that the course is somewhat uniform, will be on topological data analysis. So even though we're starting with our first workshop, even when we go to cohomology applications, we will still focus on how to apply uh, that cohomology to our data analysis. And then the last part of the workshops for this fall is on uh, computational biology. So we will just focus on data analysis of computational biology applications. Uh, but we'll also give background on the computational biology, so we'll figure out what people's background are and how much we need to you know, define what a protein is and things like that. Uh, this course, I said, will be individualized to uh, people's uh, interests and background. So if there are people who aren't interested in biology but they do want to analyze you know, data in business or data in something else, uh, I expect you know some people might join in and drop out at different times, and that's perfectly fine. In fact, you can even do that during the lecture. I know some people might have something to do at, for example, noon, and won't be able to stay for the entire time period. And so that's no issue whatsoever. So, but uh, if you are interested in analyzing uh, actual data, uh, or if you have data to analyze and you would like collaborators. Uh, please let me know sometime, uh, preferably by mid-September, so we've got time to uh, put people together in terms of collaborative groups. So if you don't have data, but you would like to actually analyze data with somebody else who's generated the data, uh, let me know. You will have time to explore some of the software, so you might not know yet whether or not you want to get into the nitty-gritty of actually analyzing the data, or whether you just want to get uh, an overview of this applied algebraic topology. Uh, so you'll have some time to play around with the software before you decide that. Uh, but if you do have data that you want to share, or if you don't have data and you would like to an help someone analyze, uh, do let me know. The other thing is, if you have any recommended material, uh, either online or offline, videos, uh, online notes, let me know. I will be posting. Someone uh, did email me last week. I've not yet posted, but I will post under recommended materials a new online source that, will, that both has an introduction to algebraic topology as well as an introduction to topological data analysis. So that will be posted under uh, recommended books uh, later on this afternoon. And if you've got additional recommendations, let me know. So just to give you a brief uh, introduction to what we're going to do before we start talking about the mapper software, we basically will be looking at data. Often, but not always, data is represented by points. So we will think about data as being points. They're frequently vectors in high-dimensional space. The vectors might be numbers 
or they might just be descriptions. So we might just have a, something that describes, you know, maybe you're monitoring students and you want to know whether they're happy or sad. Uh, so they could be descriptions, but we're frequently, you know, having some sort of points representing each data point. And you can see that there's a big difference between this data here on the left versus this data here on the right. The data here on the left has a hole. You know, so we can see that we have this hole here. That's very easy for us to see because we've got two-dimensional data. Well, what do we do if we have high-dimensional data, or what do we have? What do we do if we want the computer to recognize the hole? But one way to uh, get the, a computer or to us to recognize holes in higher-dimensional data is to basically create a simplicial complex. So. Uh, I do have a preparatory lecture six on creating simplicial complex uh, that you can listen to that actually I stole these two slides from. But basically the idea is it's actually very common in standard data analysis, not just topological data analysis, that if you have two data points, we will draw an edge between the two data points if they are close. So if they're far apart, then there is no edge connecting these two points. But if the points are close, then we can go ahead and connect the points with an edge, connect the points with an edge, and so anything that's where the points are closed, they're connected with an edge. One of the uh, unique things about topological data analysis is instead of just creating a graph with vertices and edges, you know, vertices being our data point, edges connecting our close data points, is that we will sometimes also add higher dimensional simplicities. So if three points are close together, we'll add this triangle connecting all three points. And by adding these triangles, if I add lots of triangles, I can now see that before, if I now go over and take a look at this triangle right here, if I don't fill in the triangle, I have a hole. And so how can a computer tell the difference between this hole versus this hole right here? Well, if we fill in the triangle, then the hole goes away. And so if you fill in things with triangles or with higher dimensional, so I've got these four points are close. So since these four points are close, we actually fill it in with the tetrahedron. So we have, you can kind of see that a little bit better if I draw it over here. I've got four points that are close. I'll draw it on with, you know, I've got this edge that goes here. So if you've ever seen those tetrahedral die or a pyramid with a triangle face, if we fill that in with a solid surface, we get a solid tetrahedron. And all that means, whether I can draw it in, in my two-dimensional space or not, is that I've got four points that are close together. So that tetrahedron gives me information whether I can visualize it. So if I've got 10 points that are close together, we've got uh, a 10-dimensional simplex, sorry, a, a, uh, a simplex created with, from these 10 vertices that will actually create a 9-dimensional simplex uh, telling us that we've got 10 points that are close together. So that gives us information, and more than that, it gives us the computer information so we can see that we actually do have this hole right here. So when we do our persistent homology, that's when we'll start looking at holes. And we'll just say whether or not the hole exists. That's what the software will do eventually to begin with. But we can actually say, uh, in our data, what creates that hole? Well, there's many things that will actually create the hole. Maybe I'll actually look at this path around here instead. You know, and so maybe that is actually what we will find. And then we can deform this path in order to get a nicer path that more accurately describes the whole. So how the whole is described is actually a very complicated thing. We will discuss it, uh, but that's actually not so computationally easy. But being able to see a circle in your data, that's something that software can easily handle. Being able to see a torus, so I can get this surface here, the boundary of a donut, we can see that. Uh, in data, one application we will look at, they found a Klein bottle. That's a non-orientable surface that's been found in data. So being able to see these uh, surfaces will tell you a little bit more about the shape of your data. And then you can try to explore it further to say, 
oh, I can represent a meridian. You know, what does a meridian mean in terms of my data? If, I, if my data is going around here, creating meridian, what does that mean? Versus if the data is going around in terms of a longitude, what does that mean? So that's what we will be uh, mostly focusing on when we do our persistent homology. But before we do that, let's go ahead and talk about the mapper software. So to illustrate the mapper software, I'm going to discuss this paper here, uh, which is extracting insights from the shape of complex data using topology. Uh, and this is published by Loom et al. in 2013, this year. Uh, uh, Carlson and others, they do have a, an actual professional company that you can pay to get your data and analyze using topological data analysis. Uh, and so people will actually pay to get this analysis done. So let's take a look at the first steps in terms of what we're doing here. We first have to start off with a data set. To illustrate the mapper software, we're going to start off with just a point cloud data representing a hand. So basically, uh, if you have any uh, object whatsoever, you can take a lot of points you know, that are near your object that you know, to represent your object. So if you want to know how can you represent a hand in the computer, well, one way is to take a number of points, so just a distribution of points to describe your hand. We will look at uh, more concrete examples uh, having to do with breast cancer data, basketball players uh, later on, but to illustrate having a nice uh, uh, three-dimensional representation of the hand is what we will take a look at. So the next step that we go to is, if I can get my, there's my arrow, is we color it by filter values. So we want to basically uh, reduce our complexity. We've got thousands of points representing this. We want to now project. This is actually very standard in data analysis. It's a technique used in many types of data analysis to go ahead and say, we have something, in our case, it's three-dimensional. Our data set is a three-dimensional hand. We will project it onto one dimension, and so we will take every single data point, so this data point has coordinates x, y, and z, we're going to project onto the first coordinate, the x coordinate, and then we will see how it projects onto the x coordinate. One way to project back is to go ahead and take a look at, you know, coloring, you know, the, the stuff. So let me go to the next slide to see that. Um, and so we project so this point here just gets projected onto our x-coordinate. We can then color our x-coordinate. So if high x-coordinates are blue, low ones are red, and intermediate colors in between, we can then map back. I've got a nice thinking about it symbol on it, so it doesn't want to go forward. But on the next slide, we've, again, recolored our hand in various different colors. And so we will project and color this, say, blue, uh, this one over here, red, orange, yellow. I'm really hoping that the computer is done thinking pretty soon. Okay, my PowerPoint seems to have frozen, so I'm going to open it up. So we colored the real line. Can everybody still hear me, I hope? If you can't, do a chat. <laughs> so we then take the pre-image uh, of our stuff to color it so now we can see what our x values are. So by the pre-image, notice we are just going ahead and coloring everything above this thing here will cover all this red. So uh, I, okay. so we took the pre-image and colored our stuff, but we want to do more than just take the pre-image of our x values. We actually want to group. So now we want to uh, put them our data into overlapping bins. So putting our data into overlapping bins. We can divide our real line into these intervals right here. So we'll divide our real line into 
these overlapping intervals. And then for each of these overlapping intervals, we can take its pre-image and now we binned this. So we have a red bin, we have an orange bin, a yellow bin, a green bin, a cyan bin, and a blue bin. We bin them and that breaks us up into, when we re-bin, that breaks us into several different, so it breaks our data up into all these overlapping bins. But note these bins do overlap. So this uh, pinky here is also part of it, is part of within here as well. That wasn't the pinky, but pointing figure, uh, they do overlap. We can then start clustering each bin. So I've got this bin right here. So this was a bin. We will now cluster the bin. Since we've got our eyes, we will go ahead and use our eyesight to cluster. So this will be one uh, cluster right here, one cluster right here, one cluster right there. We also have this bin right here, and so we can see that we've got these four clusters right there. For this bin, remember this was three-dimensional data, so we actually have two clusters, this one right here, as well as this cluster right there. After we cluster each of the bins, we then are going to create a network. So the next thing that we will do is create a network. To create the network, each cluster of a bin will be a vertex. So I've got a vertex for these three clusters here. I've got a vertex for these four clusters, so four different vertices here, uh, and two vertices over there. And an edge is if we have a non-empty intersection between the clusters. So remember, the, these two were actually overlapping. So I would draw an edge connecting these. So I draw edges anytime when there's an intersection, a non-empty intersection. We had a non-empty intersection. We connect those two vertices. And thus, we get our network right here. So, so in terms of our network right there. So to go from a 1,000 points for our three-dimensional diagram, we now have something that's two-dimensional, easy to visualize, easy to store. Uh, so if we had something that was 100-dimensional, it's the same kind of idea, is that you project down onto something that you can more easily visualize. And so here we project it down, and we've got this graph that we can now see. Uh, drawing graphs is also not that easy. There's a lot of software that will draw graphs. If you give it a list of, you know, vertices and edges, there's a lot of software that will draw the graphs. But if your graph does get complicated, even that can be hard to see. But the basic idea for the mapper software is you have your data set, whatever it happens to be. You then have this filter function. So some kind of filter function so that you can then put your data into overlapping bins. And then you cluster each bin, and after you cluster it, you create the network. Uh, so one vertex will represent a number of different data points. There will be some data points in both your red vertice vertex and your orange vertex. If they are, you join them with an edge. And now we have a much simpler representation of the hat. If you do have questions, feel free to interrupt at any time. You can even type them in the chat box if you prefer. Note, though, we made many, many, many choices. Uh, frequently, you have to think about how to make those choices. The better you understand the application, the better off you are. So if you're a biologist with data, what you are, if you're anything like my collaborators, what you will do is you will go and make the choices, uh, publish your paper, and then you'll go and talk to the mathematicians and see if they have any better ideas. And the mathematicians will frequently come across and say, you have really good intuition. And sometimes they'll say, well, there's this idea from mathematics, or there's this idea from statistics, and we can do this stuff here at, in addition to the brilliant stuff that you already did. And actually, all my biology collaborators really are brilliant, and they usually have great ideas before they even invite me into the picture. So let's go over the variety of choices that we made. 
one of the choices that we made was how to model the data set. There are a variety of uh, choices. In this case, we had a point cloud. So we had you know, three vertices that lived in three-dimensional spaces. We had actual coordinates. And so there's an obvious choice to use the coordinates. But there are other much more creative ways to even represent coordinates, uh, some ideas coming from mathematics and statistics or from your application. In other cases, maybe your data set is a bunch of descriptions, and so it may not be so obvious how to do it. So one thing is just how to model it, but there's also problems with your data set. So it isn't just how to do, how do we assign points? How do we know when a pair of points are close to each other? We really needed to know when the points were close to each other. Uh, but there's also frequently problems with the data set. So how do you model missing data? Especially if you're working with biology, you frequently do not have all the data. Biology techniques are not perfect, so you often have missing data. You also have noise in the data. How do you handle that? Before you probably even see the data. So if you work with a biology collaborator, they probably give you data that's already been cleaned up. It's probably not even the original data. There's probably been a few standard techniques they've done to remove background noise and other types of things. So a lot of work has been done just to create your data points. Then we needed to choose a filter function. Now, there's lots of different filter functions that we did. We chose the projecting onto the x coordinate because we saw the picture, so it made sense to project onto the x coordinate. But we could have projected onto the y coordinate. If I project onto the y coordinate, well, then I'd be binning these things together. You know, and if I bin these things together, my, you know, I'm going to just have one cluster in each of my bins, and my intersection just gives me a nice boring line. That didn't give me a lot of information. And so how you choose your filter function states whether or not you get something interesting, like we got here, or something rather boring that we got here. We will talk about generalizing the filter function. You don't have to go into just the real line. You can go into the two-dimensional plane, three-dimensional space. You can go into something completely, totally different. As long as you can cover this space and bring it back, that will work. So there's actually a lot of choices in terms of your filter function. And you can use multiple filter functions. Uh, some standard ones from statistics, principal component analysis. We'll talk about some of these things when we actually use them. But there's a lot of different choices. Uh, many of these choices uh, do have to do with uh, distance. So, they, so if you have some notion of similarity between your points and idea of distance, that does make it easier to analyze the data. But it's not an absolute requirement. Unless you choose some of these things. You know, here it is the distance between x and p, so I have to have a distance. So the other thing we did is then we put the data into our overlapping bins. So I had my filter function, but now we need to figure out how to divide up, use that filter function to divide up our data. So I chose intervals. You know, so I chose an interval that were overlapping to go ahead, and so overlapping intervals to go ahead and go back up to the data set. Uh, we can choose length of equal, inter you know, equal length intervals, but we still have two choices. We still have the length, and we still have the overlap. So there's a lot of choices there as well. Uh, but uh, that does mean, there's two things that means. One of those things is we get to choose our resolution. I'm writing with the mouse, so I may not spell out the entire word resolution. So. So that's the word resolution written right there. So you get to choose the resolution. How many, uh, how many intervals do we actually want? Do we want a finer resolution or a larger resolution? So that means we get to choose the scale of our problem. So we can look at the scale at our problem in a multi-scale way. So instead of just taking a look at the, the output of one, so we just did one binning. We just did one binning right here. I could have taken a look at finer bins. So maybe I might have. Uh, you know, taking a look at more intervals. Maybe I might have went finer and finer into a finer scale. 
So you get to choose the scale of your object. Um, but that also means a lot of choices. One way to get around with how you make those choices is something called persistence. It's the same idea when we get to persistent homology. And that's basically to take a look at a variety of different scales, a variety of different uh, percent overlaps, and seeing what is most robust, what sticks around for longest. If you only see something for a very short period of time, then it could just be an artifact in your data. If you see something for a very long period of time, so if I look at a variety of different lengths, and it persists over a lot of different lengths, then it probably is a very robust thing, and it probably has meaning. It's probably very meaningful to your data. We then need to choose how to cluster. Uh, we were able to easily cluster this data because we have eyes and we could see that all these points, you know, uh, that are here, all these points here, you know, I want to cluster them into one thing. We could see that by eyesight. But clustering in itself is a whole field. You could take a year-long course. You could get a PhD in clustering. Uh, so there's a lot of choices there. They frequently, again, require a distance between points. Uh, so that's uh, another choice. Once we've made those choices, then we can go ahead and create the network. So that once we've made all those choices, then we know what a vertex means and we know what an edge means. But until we've made all those choices, uh, we are, um, you know, won't know what our, they will definitely affect what network we get uh, depending upon our choices. So we've made lots and lots of choices. I took the quote from this paper. It's useful to think of those choices as a camera with lens adjustments and other settings. A different filter function may generate a network with a different shape, thus allowing one to explore the data from a different mathematical or biological or business perspective. So depending upon what you want to look at, you can choose a different filter function and explore from a variety of different perspectives. But that also means you can get false positives. So maybe we're in business and we want the data to mean something in particular. Or maybe we want our next grant to get funded and if our data means something in particular. Uh, so we can go ahead and you know change our filter, change this, and get it to be what we want it to be. Uh, if you have a lot of choices, uh, you might be able to do that. Uh, this is where you want to look at robustness and see if it actually is robust over a lot of different choices. So you do have to be very careful in false positives. If you take any data analysis course, if you're looking at a lot of things, you are going to get false positives. So you do want to see if your choices are robust. Uh, so false positives will occur. But if they do persist, if it's robust, that's a good thing, and so that would be a good indication. Okay. So I want to talk about generalizing uh, the filter function, or you know, uh, or filters in general. Remember, we basically broke it up into this covering. I actually didn't need. I didn't need this thing down here. I didn't need a function. I didn't need a function that went to my R. All I needed was something that partitioned here. So I've got really two choices. I can go ahead and do a filter function, and that is the standard thing to do. That is actually what the mapper software will do, is you want to give it a filter function. And then once you have the filter function down to here, you then partition up this data. So we, we find a cover of our real line with you know, different percent overlap different lengths of our interval, or depending upon our stuff, we might have in different lengths of intervals. And so generally, we will get a covering of our codomain. We'll get a covering of whatever we map our data into. But we could cover our original data. So that's, but the question is, how would you cover your original data? But if your data doesn't correspond to numbers, you might have an idea based upon your application as to how to completely your, cover your data with overlapping sets. And so I could cover my data, you know, with as long as I covered it somehow. Uh, I probably didn't need something that was a subset of it, but I really don't have the greatest mouse control. Uh, 
So we can cover it with a bunch of things, and then we bend the different things. So as long as you've got a covering, it doesn't have to come from a map. I'm going to um, try to cover, do that one covering, so we'll go ahead and go back to our function again. So if we go back to assuming we have a filter function, so we have a function that goes from our data set, instead of into R1, we can go into the plane. So we can map these points here to various points in the plane, depending maybe on the x, y, z coordinate. So maybe I'll project onto both x and y. Or maybe I'll project onto density or L centrality or some other idea. Uh, or maybe I'll do density and the x coordinate. So there's a variety of different things. You can choose two different properties and project onto both of them. And once you do that, we can then take a covering of our plane. And so you can see we've covered our plane with overlapping rectangles here. So you've got overlapping rectangles. And, and then once we have that, we can then take back where the overlapping rectangles go to to determine what our overlapping bins look like. And it doesn't have to be rectangles. We could do a hexagon, so anything that we want to do. That also means that when you choose you know, uh, a filter function, so if I do two filter functions that go into R, I can combine them and to go into the two-dimensional plane, R2. That also means that when I go ahead and create my graph, I could actually do a simplicial complex instead. So in here, when I go back, we can see that I do have, uh, you know, the, these two sets intersect. So if they go back to these two points, I would go ahead and create this edge over here. But I also have an intersection here as well as an intersection here, which means I can fill in a triangle and get a simplicial complex. So you could create a simplicial complex instead if we go into R2. So there's a lot of different things that one create, can create uh, using this idea. So to refresh what we were doing with our topological data analysis, we basically have three key ideas uh, that you know, make our topological data analysis better than standard data analysis. Okay, some standard data analysis people are welcome to disagree with me. Uh, the more ways you have to look at things, the better. So if you can work with on biology data with both a biologist as well as a computer scientist, as well as a statistician, as well as a mathematician, looking at it from multiple different ways, that would be ideal. But the benefits of topological data analysis, one of the benefits is that it is coordinate free. It didn't matter whether I use polar coordinates, Euclidean coordinates, or, or what kind of coordinates I did. Uh, if I stretched out the coordinates, that wouldn't have had uh, a major effect. So it really is coordinate free, so that's quite nice. Um, so no dependence on the coordinate system. We can compare data thus derived from different platforms. So if you are, for example, uh, comparing brain data from MRIs and you use, or PET scans, and you use different machines, how do you, or microarrays at different times, you know, these comparisons are very difficult to do. In topological data analysis, that's actually not as big of a problem. So it's, it'll be easy to compare data from different platforms. So if you're setting different technologies, different labs, different methodologies, where standardization is difficult, topological data analysis has some great benefits there. Partially also because it's invariant under small deformations. So that's the other thing. If you've got different platforms that deform the data differently, you know, your topological data analysis, that's exactly what topology is about. Topologically, these two horses are the same. They've just moved a little bit, but they're still topologically the same connections. Even if I start taking a look a little bit uh, at a finer way of looking at it, and we can see if we use the mapper software, the mapper software turned my horse into this diagram right here. This image, by the way, came from the paper Topological Methods for the Analysis of High Dimensional Datasets and 3D Object Recognition. Uh, with the link uh, given right here. Uh, and if we take a look at the horse in this configuration, we get this confirmation. 
if we take the horse in this conformation, we get this conformation right here. And we can see that there's some big similarities between the two. Now, there is, I would imagine, that this little segment right here is probably equivalent to this. Uh, when it comes to embedding your graph and comparing the two graphs, you know, there are some challenges there. But we can see that comparing them should be a little bit uh, uh, easier. And here, in terms of topology, you know, if you listen to you know, my first video, you're wondering, well, topologically, a horse is the same thing as a three-dimensional ball. Because I can deform all the, you know, this, you know, this leg here, and I can, if, it, if the horse were made from clay, I could push this leg in and just create this three-dimensional ball. Uh, and so these flares, you know, why am I actually seeing flares? I should just, it should all be collapsed to a single point, and that's all I should be getting. Well, in the topological data analysis, because we were creating these graphs, we actually do get more than just our basic topology. We can see these things that are called flares, you know, these things that come out over here. And the flares are preserved. You know, we still see the flares over here. We still see all the same flares. And so in this topological data analysis, we do see more things than just a horse is a three-dimensional ball. We can actually see that the horse is different than a three-dimensional ball using that for, and even using persistent homology depending upon what, how you're doing it. Um, but it is less sensitive to noise, and so I can still see that I still have a horse, and in the paper they could distinguish the horse from a face, from an elephant, etc. The other thing, and this is standard in data analysis, so most data analysis, you do compress your data. But in our case, we get a, a compressed representation of our shape. So we can still somewhat see the shape. Uh, so our hand right here, we can still see that our hand looks like a hand. You know, it's a, you know we have thousands of points representing our hand. Now we just have 13 vertices and 12 edges, and it still represents the basic shape. Okay, by basic shape, this represented a horse. <laughs> Oops. So, ah. you know, this over here represented a horse. That doesn't look to me like a horse too much. So your idea of representing the shape, you know, uh, how much we mean by representing the shape. Here, it really represents the hand nicely. But you still still get some visual identification. And even over here, you know, that if I travel along here, I might be traveling, you know, along here. So it still does give me a visual representation. I can map what this flare means back to this horse. And so it still will give me a visual representation, maybe not as good as the actual picture of the horse, but it will still give me some visual representation. And so that uh, is the main things. We will talk about the real applications on Wednesday, but we're going to uh, end uh, five minutes early and just talk uh, to people in the class. So if you're not officially registered, uh, you can exit if you wish. I will stop recording the meeting now. You can listen in if you wish, uh, but we'll stop recording.